how would you go about choosing the most perfect power switch ever created? Okay, most perfect is quite a high bar. But you'd probably start with the application itself, right? What kind of size do you need? What kind of energy efficiency requirements do you need? What the cost will be? What the environment around your design will be? And each of these answers have sub-answers because the most perfect power switch could be GAN, silicon junction, or silicon carbide. Maybe we should back up a bit and start with the properties of each of these wide-band gap semiconductors. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Jog Talk. Wide-band gap semiconductor materials are great choices for next-generation power converter switches. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Matthew Reynolds from Infineon and I explore the benefits and trade-offs of gallium nitride, silicon junction, and silicon carbide power switching technology. The importance that body diode performance plays in these solutions, and how you can take advantage of gallium nitride, silicon carbide, and silicon junction wide band gap power solutions from Infineon in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Matthew. Thank you so much for joining me. Ah, easy. Happy to be here. So we're talking about choosing the ideal semiconductor technology for your topology today. But before we talk about the trade-offs between silicon, silicon carbide, and gallium nitride, what all will we be covering today? Well, that encompasses it, which is quite a bit. But yeah, we'll be looking at silicon carbide, silicon junction products, which have been around for many years, and then, of course, GAN. So we're in a unique situation today where we've been working with silicon junction for many, many years. But there's two new wideband gap technologies, GAN and silicon carbide, that are certainly disrupting the industry. So we're going to look at some of the attributes of all three of the technologies and maybe give a little bit of insight into where you might use one over the other. Okay, great. So, Matthew, what kind of design considerations should we keep in mind when it comes to choosing a power switch? Uh, there's many, but I chose a few here to look at. I think in the top left-hand corner, you can see that these would be the attributes or the, maybe the electrical specifications or the variables, I would say, when considering looking at silicon junction, GAN, or carbide. What exactly you're doing or what power topology you're using may lend itself to better for one technology over the other. It really lends itself to GAN. Efficiency, certainly that's a wide band gap attribute there. But cost is silicon junction. We're always cost sensitive. And then environmental condition. There's lots of different conditions, lots of variables that will have an impact on the difference between silicon carbide, silicon junction, and GAN. So, Matthew, how does the material properties of these different solutions come into play when we're choosing a power switch? Well, they so much don't come into play, but it gives you an understanding of why wide band gap has become really the talk of the power semiconductor world today. What is the ideal switch, right? The ideal switch would have zero conduction losses, can stand off a very large voltage, and switches almost infinitely fast. So there's your perfect switch. So what wide band gap does, if you look on the left-hand side, you can see that, well, as you start moving from silicon junction, which has a band gap of 1.1, and you start moving up towards 4, if you remember your semiconductor physics, that's not a semiconductor anymore. That is a, call it an insulator. So there's the standoff voltage at that point. But usually there's an inverse relationship between band gap and breakdown field and electron mobility, but we don't see that here with wide band gap. So here we're starting to move towards that perfect switch where we're able to stand off a very large voltage, but really doesn't affect the electron mobility of it. So that's the key right there. Okay, so what about the technical differences of these different solutions? How do they compare? We love to talk about figure of merits in the semiconductor industry. And although I don't think they really have much of a practical point to be made when we talk about figure of merits, but it does give you a benchmark or an indication of how one product or one technology works better than the other. So in this slide, you can see that we take a similar devices or at least similar as we can. So on the left-hand side, we take two silicon junction products, one with a very strong body diode and one without a strong body diode. 
we talk about our GAN products and our silicon carbide products. Both of them have about a breakdown voltage of 600, 650 volts. And then the figure of merit. What's important is the RDS on here. I keep it at 50 milliohms. So remember, with semiconductors, if I change the RDS on, I'm going to change all the other characteristics. A great example would be if I took a ball of 50 milliohm device and I halved the RDS on to 25 milliohms. Effectively, I'm almost doubling the die area of the device, and that'll affect the capacitances. So it's very important to keep the figure of merits the same here, and that is the breakdown voltage and the RDS on. So what is the channel resistance when the device is on? It's 50 milliohms. So the importance here is we could always be a little bit tricky with how we compare devices, but if we keep the figure of merits the same, then it's less tricky to do so. And it gives the consumer a really good idea of what these products can do. Look at the silicon junction, compare it to the uh, silicon carbide and the GAN, quite small on both the GAN and the wideband GAT devices. Look how small the uh, silicon carbide is relative to the silicon junction, but not as small as the GAN. And this is important because GAN does not have a body diode. So these are the two most important, I would say, figure of merits that I would point out in this slide. Okay, so let's talk about body diodes. Why are they so important? Yeah, you cannot have a conversation between these three technologies and especially GAN without talking about the body diode. So the incumbent silicon junction products, we've developed these products to have a very strong body diode or no emphasis placed on the body diode. And this is going to depend on the topology you use. But anytime you're looking at a power converter talking or working with a half bridge, full bridge, maybe the totem pole PFC, this is based on the half bridge topology. So the idea is that you're going to be switching the top device, which I call switch one here, and switch two alternately on and off. What's really important is you can't have both of those switches on at the same time because you would essentially short out the input voltage. So there's a brief period of time where both switches are off. And during that brief period of time, the diode is conducting the current. And this is critically important for these types of converters. And this is also where a lot of the losses in power conversion takes place. What about the body diode of a MOSFET? What does that look like? Right, right. There's a difference. We can create and develop these silicon junction products to be very specific to types of topologies and applications. I didn't know this as a beginning power supply engineer, but now I know it quite well. So it's just not a MOSFET. There's a lot of technology that goes into this, and we can start to manipulate the characteristics and the properties of these devices to really be applicable to particular applications. So here we have a silicon junction device. Both of them are very similar. They're a 950 volt standoff voltage. They have 450 milliohms of uh, channel resistance. And one has a strong body diode and one has a weak body diode on it. And you can see not only in, in how quickly it can commutate the current by the DIDT, but also you can see it in the charge. So the charge is significantly less with a product that has a strong body diode. Okay. so. When would the performance of a body diode be important? This is a great illustration to show you where you'd use one over the other. So on the left-hand side, we have a power factor correction converter. This is a, what they call a single-ended topology. The diode is only going to go in a unidirectional from the uh, drain to source of that diode on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, what you see, or is in the middle, I would say, is the half-bridge converter. These diodes are very important because the switches will be turning on and off alternatively and the diode will conduct. So here you'd use the PFD7 on the half bridge topology and there's no need for it. You could use it in the power factor correction circuit, but that's not necessary. Okay, so what about solutions for hard switching applications? What would you suggest here? So with a hard switch, we're going to talk a little bit about the half bridge, full bridge topologies. And there's two choices you have or the designer has here. You can go hard switch where alternatively the top and bottom MOSFETs are turning off and on. Just a brief period of dead time to ensure that the two switches aren't off at the same time. So during this time, your losses, as you can see, hard switching losses, as I point out here, it's an addition of the conduction losses, the diode losses, the turning on and turning off losses, uh, I would say the transition losses, and then the losses in the diode, the QRR losses, and also you have to charge and discharge the output capacitance. And so this is how a hard switch converter works. More or less a figure of merit, I've taken three different technologies here, silicon junction, silicon carbide, and GAN, and I've compared them. So what's really of note here is the losses in the diode, the P, what I call QRR here. 
And you can see with the uh, silicon junction, the nanocoulombs on the silicon junction product are 770 nanocoulombs. Silicon carbide is pretty small at 125. No body diode on the GAN product, so that's zero. So we also need to talk about reverse recovery loss as well, right? That's right. So what I just brought up with the PQRR, I wanted to make a practical example to show you the significance of it. So I took a half-bridge converter, 8 kilowatt switch mode power supply, 400 volt bus at 20 amps, and I'm switching at 100 kilohertz. So let's compare the three technologies, same devices here. Let's start out with a silicon junction on the left-hand side. 31 watts of losses on that one device. That's pretty significant. Not zero, but pretty small is the silicon carbide at five watts. And then because there is no body diode, zero watts of losses on the GAN device. 31 watts on an 8 kilowatt switch mode power supply may not seem a lot. I think it works out to about a half a percent of efficiency, but it does add up. That's one switch, and that's just the loss due to the body diode. I think the point to be made here is your 31 watts on a device is probably going to be a challenge for most engineers to get that heat out of the device. So even though it may not think of it as a, a large inefficiency, it is going to be troublesome for the design engineer to get that heat out of that device and out into the air. So what about resonant converters? Why would we want to use that kind of technology? Right. So the other choice we have on the half-bridge topologies is resonant operation. And the first thing most engineers will think, well, during the transition time, if I wait long enough, that switch node will eventually go to zero. So that's how we have zero voltage switching. We wait for that switch node to move to zero, and then we'll switch the devices on. So why would it make a difference if I was using carbide, silicon junction, or GAN? If I wait to zero, there should be no losses. And this is exactly true. The problem is the period of time you have to wait due to the large capacitances of silicon junction is long. So here on this page, you can see that on the left-hand side, there's a transition between the current and the voltage of a GAN switch. And in the middle, we have, a once again, the C7 product, which is silicon junction. And that dead time is quite long. So in order to switch quickly, you need to wait, or maybe you can't switch quickly because you need to wait for that switch node to move to zero volts. So this is the key here with resonant converter. It doesn't necessarily make the converter any more efficient by using a wide band gap, but what it does allow you, especially with GAN, is the parasitic capacitances or the capacitances that are of the device are so small that you can switch quite quickly, eight times faster here, without realizing additional losses. Most of the time we're familiar with the higher switching frequencies increase the switching losses. Here the switching losses haven't increased at all. They've remained the same between silicon junction and GAN. But what you have done is you've enabled your device to switch eight times faster. A great example would be if you're switching at 125 kilohertz with silicon junction, you could easily move that to almost one megahertz and realize no additional losses. And this is really probably the most significant I would say attribute of GAN, and if you're looking for very high power density converters, you're going to want to switch at a much, much higher switching speed. So Matthew, how does GAN perform in single-ended topologies? Well, GAN does perform in single-ended topologies, but I would say the benefit is very limited, and that goes for silicon carbide as well. With these topologies here is the classic boost PFC, the flyback and the two transistor forward. The current is unidirectional. The body diode is never in use here. And it's very limited. So I would say there are times and places and applications where you may want to use GAN or silicon carbide in these topologies, but it's very limited. Given the current pricing of the silicon carbide and GAN compared to silicon junction, I would probably spend a little extra money on the silicon junction product to get the performance over the GAN or the carbide. Okay, so if not single-ended topologies, where would GAN provide a significant performance benefit? Yeah, not only GAN, but also silicon carbide. So this is a little bit of a summary slide of the previous three to four slides. So the control strategy, right? Where would you use GAN or possibly carbide? So definitely for hard switching, as I spoke, that body diode is really important. There's going to be a lot of losses due to that body diode, especially in silicon junction. No body diode in the GAN, so of course that's going to work out really well. You're going to realize a really efficient design. 
And then for soft switching or what we call zero voltage switching, the losses aren't increased or decreased so much with GAN or carbide, but the ability to switch at a much higher switching frequency. So here I set it at 250 kilohertz. If you were looking at a converter, power density was quite important. You needed to reduce the size of your magnetics and your capacitances you'll be switching at probably a greater switching frequency than 250 kilohertz. Certainly GAN is going to be important at that time. It may not even be achievable with silicon junction products. Okay, so Matthew, can you give us an example of an application that would benefit from the lower shift in RDS on versus junction temperature of silicon carbide versus silicon MOSFET technology? Yeah, this is an important slide that I needed to present because it really starts to show you the benefit. We've been talking about GAN quite a bit, but what we really want to point out is some benefits of the carbide, and there's no better slide than this. So in a data sheet, you'll look at the RDS on of the three different products, and they usually indicate what the RDS on is. Maybe they'll give it to you at a couple different temperatures, 25 degrees C, 100 degrees C, and maybe 150 degrees C. But the temperature or the RDS on that you have at 25 degrees C, which isn't really of much use to the design engineer, isn't the RDS on that you'll be using when this product is operational. So the difference is, is as the temperature increases, so did the RDS on. And you'll see there's quite a bit of difference between the cool moss, the cool sick, and the GAN, or just silicon junction, silicon carbide, and GAN type products. So here we've normalized the RDS on to one at 25 degrees C, and you can look at the RDS on as the temperature increases. What's really to note here is the cool sick is quite flat. And what I mean by that is the RDS on that is realized at 25 degrees C is mostly the RDS on you'll see at 100 degrees C, maybe even 125 degrees C, only slightly greater than this. So the significance of this is two. One, you may be able to use less silicon carbide because the RDS on hasn't increased that much over silicon junction products or GAN products. So that's quite important. Carbide is not, it's probably the most expensive of the three technologies, but there are times where, depending on how you're using it and the environmental conditions, it may be less expensive to use silicon carbide due to this right here. The other attribute of carbide that I would bring in is that this really gives you an indication of what carbide can do for you. Carbide is an amazing physical property of technology and that it's very robust and can handle temperature quite well. The ability to get the temperature out of the dye and into the environment is significantly better than the other two technologies. Okay, so you mentioned avalanche and overvoltage protection earlier. Mm -hmm. So can we take a closer look at those as well? Sure. So most design engineers are very familiar with avalanching and avalanching energy. This is uh, common with silicon junction and silicon carbide devices, where as the voltage across the drain source and its off state increases, eventually there'll become a voltage level where the channel starts conducting current. This is worst case scenario. You have a high voltage across the drain to source, and now you have current traveling through that device. Power will increase extremely quickly, and power is heat, and heat was eventually what will destroy the device. Device. So we've become familiar with this, and here this is the illustration. But the reason for bringing this up is because GAN acts quite differently, and it needs to be discussed. Silicon junction and silicon carbide, this is some of the characteristics. See, So the breakdown voltage that you see on the data sheet, usually there's margin placed on this. So if you purchase a 650-volt device, the device won't start to avalanche at 651 volt. There's quite a bit of margin placed on that. The other point to be made is breakdown voltage in silicon carbide and silicon junction devices actually increases with temperature. So the breakdown voltage is at probably at 25 degrees Celsius, but at die temperature rises to 100, 125 degrees C temperature, that breakdown voltage will actually increase. This is good, less likely to go into avalanche, right? That's the good news. The bad news is that avalanche energy, the capability of the device, decreases quite significantly with the junction temperature. So on the right-hand side, you could see the avalanche energy in millijoules, its capabilities, it's rated at 25 degrees C, but at 150 degrees Celsius, basically there is no capability or avalanche energy. That's how silicon carbide and silicon junction works. Now let's talk about GAN. GAN does not avalanche. It, it behaves quite differently than silicon junction and, and silicon carbide. On the right-hand side, we have two curves, one at 25 degrees Celsius and 150 degrees Celsius. Here you see the opposite effect. The device will break down at a higher temperature, not a lower temperature. So that's important. Also, in the data sheet of GAN, usually you won't see an energy avalanche uh, capability. 
Although power and time is millijoules or joules, you don't see that in the data sheet here. So what we do specify is a minimum and a maximum voltage at different temperatures. And this will give you an indication of what the device is capable of doing. I would suppose at the end of the day, there's nothing like testing the device. And most all power engineers are going to test their devices, whether it's silicon junction, silicon carbide, or GAN. But often a question I get is, what is the avalanche energy of a GAN device? And it needs to be pointed out, there really is no avalanche energy of the device. It doesn't behave in the same manner. Okay, so Matthew, can we dig into some use cases? Yeah, let's spend a few minutes. It's good to put some practical picture on this. So here we have a flyback converter. Can you use GAN and silicon carbide? Yes, you can. And there are applications where you might want to. Maybe the temperature variations are quite enormous. You want to use a carbide in that sense. But for the most part, I would be spending a few extra pennies on a really good silicon junction device over GAN or carbide in these. Remember, silicon junction has a long, long, long time. to. It'll be around for quite some time. It's not dead yet. And the next circuit I have, I show a cycle converter. So this is something you would find maybe on a solar panel where you're converting a solar energy to AC grid energy. Here, GAN is quite popular, but also you could use a silicon junction. It depends on where you're using it. On the primary side or what I would call the panel side, silicon junction, lower voltage products, really do compete really well at GAN. I think eventually GAN will overtake these types of devices, but today, very, very low RDS on very well-functioning silicon junction products usually find a home there. Now on the AC side, silicon junction will probably certainly find its home sooner than later. And this is mostly due to the topology and the body diode and the function of the device. Higher efficiency is going to really drive the design engineers for GANs and these products. And eventually, let's talk about the totem pole PFC. You may not think that this is a half-bridge topology, but it is. So on the left-hand side, we have what we call a unidirectional. So the power is only in, in one direction from left to right. Very popular topology today is the bidirectional total pole PFC. So this is where we see it in battery energy storage systems, bidirectionally charging with an EV car. This is a common topology here. You have two different legs here. You have the silicon carbide or the GAN fast switching leg, or this is what I would use on the fast switching leg on the left-hand side. And then the right-hand side, the silicon junction devices. And the silicon junction devices are turning off and on at about 120 hertz, so half of the AC sine wave. And they're just really steering the current through to the output. So slow switching, silicon junction, fast switching would be the silicon carbide or the GAN devices. And finally, a system solution. The takeaway here is we're talking about what device is better, but there really is no what device is better or there's no single answer here. I think most of the products that I work on currently, you'll find that there's a, a home for each one of these technologies. And in this illustration, I show you totem pole PFC is on the left-hand side. I'm going to use GAN or carbide for this fast switching leg. I'm going to use a particular device called our S7 for slow switching on the slow switching leg of the totem pole. And then on the half bridge, we've shown this already once or twice, GAN or possibly a silicon junction device, but with a fast body diode is going to be the technology of choice there. Low voltage MOSFETs, here our OptiMOS devices are working quite well. Could use GAN, but I think today anyways, the OptiMOS devices work really well in this application. And the takeaway here is no one particular technology will always fit every application. It's a combination of the three technologies to get your best design. And then finally, we'll get solid state circuit breakers. This is something that I work quite a lot with. This is a great application for carbide. It can be used silicon junction for the 15 amp to 20 amp circuit breakers. But here again, the ability for silicon carbide to withstand very harsh environments, including temperature, there's no substitute for it here. This is a great application for silicon carbide that we see. Excellent. So before I let you go, Matthew, can you recap your main points for me? Yes. Yeah, so silicon junction, as I said, it's a mature technology. It's been around at least 25 years and has been recently it's slow developments. It's improvements, but it's slow. It's incremental. Silicon carbide and GAN, they've been around for quite some time, but really they've just now started to get the economies of scale and the applications working. So it's a pretty exciting time. Just having one of those technologies to work with other than silicon junction would be pretty remarkable, but now we have two of them. And I would also say that the improvements on the silicon carbide and the GAN are going to be pretty substantial over the next few years. So we're just getting started with those. I would say GAN's a little bit more complicated to work with. Remember, the beauty of the GAN is it doesn't have a body diode, but also what's important about it is it has very low input and output capacitances. 
So that's great because you get those very fast transition times and such. But what happens when the GAN device capacitance becomes so low that other capacitances in your design can sometimes start to dominate or affect the performance? And this is where you need to be very, very careful with your layout. You need to be very careful in the way you assess the boards. So it can be a little bit more tricky to work with, I would say. In summary, I would say GAN, if you're looking for the highest power density, there's no substitute for GAN. And this is what we see today with the power converters, such as laptop computers, the USB chargers, and then other applications like this. If you need high power density, GAN is probably a technology you'd want to be looking for. Carbide, as you move towards voltages over 650 volts, 700 volts, Carbide is going to be your choice there, also for harsh conditions. And then silicon junction, there's no substitute for it. Lots of different great products today with silicon junction, and it's very cost effective, and I'm sure it'll be around for many, many years to come. Excellent. Well, Matthew, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.